Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to our Pride in Our Workplace June meeting. Um, and in celebration of Pride uh, here at PIOW, we thought uh, we couldn't think of a better way to celebrate June Pride Month but to amplify and prop up the voices of our trans community. Um, what a great way to celebrate the tea this Pride Month. So thank you all for joining us. You know, we hope that you had an opportunity to join us back on May 20th when we had a very thoughtful panel discussion on the lived experiences of trans individuals in the workplace. Um, it was a great um, session. We had a lot of great learnings from it. Um, and we're happy today to bring you part two of that session, which is really thinking about how to implement policy and best, best practices in organizations. We have some great expert panelists today that are going to share their experiences in the workplace and leadership roles um, and educate us a little bit about what's happening um, from a legislative perspective in the trans community as well. So uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, I'd like to first, uh, before we begin, thank our sponsors who have been incredible supporters of Pride in Our Workplace over many years. Um, and for 2021, um, I want to recognize Biogen, Kogo Labs, Fidelity Investments, Harborvest, Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, Lock Lord, Loomis Sales, State Street, and Tufts Health Plan. Thank you all very much for your support, advocacy. Um, we really are thrilled to have you on board again this year. So thank you. Um, if you weren't able to, well, actually, let's go to the agenda. We'll share with you what we're going to talk about today. Um, I'm just going to pick up a few key learnings um, from the first session. If you didn't have a chance to attend that, we'll just review a couple of things that, that we thought were really important learnings um, from that. Um, then I'll turn it over to Colleen Simonelli, who is one of our board members, also the chief HR officer at Wolf & Company, and she will be our moderator today. She will you know, introduce the panel, and then we'll have a really great conversation um, of best practices, policies, legal issues, and other ways that organizations can and will support uh, transgender employees. Uh, we'll open it up for a question and answer, um, and then we'll give you a little bit of a sneak preview into some of the work that's happening um, with this topic in the fall uh, from Cheryl Caton, another board member from Pride in Our Workplace. So uh, thanks again for joining us. Um, so a couple of things that we, we pulled away from our first uh, panel, um, you know, oftentimes companies have really good trans inclusion policies, um, but, but they also re we also realize that we need to have the resources on a day-to-day -day basis um, to really give transgender employees the support that they need in the workplace. Um, so it's really about, you know, how does that corporate culture make you feel? What are the values of the organization? You know, when you walk into the organization, do you feel that level of support and commitment from leadership and other employees within the organization? Um, can, can employees safely report microaggressions or other situations that have happened where they've felt marginalized or discriminated against? And will they get that support from leadership to help resolve those issues? Um, you know, this one I think was really critically important as we started to build these two panels this, this past year is, you know, have any trans employees been promoted to company leadership? We had a really hard time finding transgender leaders to participate in some of our panel conversations that, you know, it, you know, we have a great network of folks and, you know, we have an off really powerhouse panel today, but that first panel, we really were challenged to find leaders um, that were trans within organizations that were in senior level roles, which is a problem that I think, you know, we need to focus on. Um, you know, are trans people being hired? Um, are there under, underlying reasons why people aren't being retained or promoted? So, you know, those are the kinds of things that we talked about and, and learned from our lived experience panel in May. Um, and also allyship was a really big topic in the, first, in the first conversation. You know, and one of the things that stuck out to me was how, you know, we think of an ally as a person, but it's really an action, right? Allyship is really what, what you're willing to do as an individual to truly advocate and support your transgender colleagues. It's a constant practice of supporting others um, and something that we all need to work towards, right? So it is a verb uh, in so many ways. Um, and then how to be an effective ally at work, you know, listen to the trans people in your life, follow their lead. You know, I think we oftentimes make the mistake that every trans person's experience is exactly the same. And that's obviously not true. Um, and, you know, how to be a better ally to your to the trans folks in your life. Um, communicate, learn and learn, uh, require vulnerability from everyone involved. You know, believe the stories, listen to the stories, um, you know, develop the ability to correct yourself and learn from your mistakes and respect personal boundaries set by colleagues. And we had some great 
stories, uh, workplace stories that our panel shared with us um, that really illuminated some of these, these topics. Um, and you know, leverage your privilege to educate others and foster safe, inclusive environments. The more you learn, the more you understand, the more you educate yourself, um, and the more you, um, you know, advocate for others, the better off you'll be. I think workplace education advocacy is not the responsibility of the trans employees. We heard that over and over and over again. We all have to educate ourselves and we all have to be advocates. So some really great sort of points um, that came out of those that for that first discussion that we just wanted to bring back to you to share um, before we enter into the next the next conversation. So. Um, I'm thrilled to have you all with us today, and I'm thrilled to have this panel discussion. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to my friend and colleague, Colleen Simonelli, Pride board member and chief people officer at Wolf and Company. Colleen, thank you so much for moderating us today. Thank you, John, and hello, everybody. I'm I'm really thrilled and honored to be here. And John, you have me reflecting on the um, on the last panel and how we really heard heartfelt stories of people's lived experiences in the workplace. Um, and it really stayed with me for a while. And today I'm excited to kind of transition and think about how do we support people in, in the workplace? Um, and we have an amazing panel. So um, I'll just take a moment to introduce myself. As John said, I'm the currently the Chief People Officer at Wolf & Company. And um, I'm also a proud member of the Board of Directors for PIOW. Um, I am a cisgender straight female uh, and I use the pronouns she, her, hers. Uh, I, I myself strive to be an ally, but um, you know, I say allyship is like beauty. It's I think in the, the eye of the beholder. <laughs> and so it's not uh, me that can give myself that label, but it's um, you know, it's it's hopefully others and how I show up with my actions. I'm really excited to uh, have this panel discussion today. Um, as I said, we're going to focus on ways to create an inclusive workplace for people that identify as transgender. And so we'll talk broadly about the legal landscape and the significant shifts that are happening um, and across the country. And then we'll get into detail on specific actions organizations can take to attract, support, develop, and retain employees that are transgender. So um, I hope you're able to walk away with some very practical ideas on how you can make a difference in your organization whether you work in HR, you work in DE&I, or you work in an employee resource group, or if you're just here to learn. And I think we all have a lot to learn from our panelists. So with that, I'd like to invite the panelists to introduce themselves, um, starting with Jennifer Levi. Levi. Jennifer, I told you I was gonna screw that up. Um, Jennifer is the director at the Transgender Rights Project at GLAAD. Jennifer. Thank you, Colleen. And it's Totally fine. Uh, I really want to th thank Pride in Our Workplace for hosting this uh, conversation. And thank you, John, so much. And to all my co-panelists, it's really an honor to uh, join you today. So um, I am a, a lawyer and I direct something called the Transgender Rights Project at an organization called GLBTQ Legal Advocates and Defenders, otherwise known as GLAD, um, sometimes referred to as GLAD with a single A to distinguish us from some other GLADs that are out there. And GLAD is a public interest law firm that is focused on ending discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, gender identity, and HIV status. And we do our work through litigation, uh, legislative advocacy, and public education. Um, I've been at GLAD actually for over 20 years. So I feel like I've really seen some incredibly significant and dramatic changes over that time. Um, I'm also a law professor, just to say, at Western New England uh, University. And as you can see from my Zoom title, I am comfortable with the use of any pronouns in reference to me. I do identify as transgender. Um, and uh, while this experience is not the same for everyone, I am comfortable with people using pronouns that refer to me based on uh, uh, their reflection, their sense of uh, my gender identity, and um, uh, really excited and happy to have this conversation today. So I'll turn it back to you, Colleen. Great, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, I know that um, when we were preparing for the session, I was really excited. Jennifer really brings a unique perspective, and you know, of kind of like the zoom out, big picture of what's going on. So I'm excited to hear more from you. Um, Irene, would you like to introduce yourself? Irene Brank is a workplace trans inclusion coach at Brank Consulting. 
such a great title. I'm not sure where it came from. So um, uh, thank you all just as, as Jennifer did. And um, I'm just honored to be on this panel. So thanks for having me. Um, so I've been in the corporate world for over 30 years and I'm never gonna say more than that, although it definitely is more than that. So I'm sticking with 30 plus years um, and really most recently have uh, had some um, experience in HR and DNI as things have changed. And I really like to start with my, my pride why. Right. So why am I so invested in the transgender community and in in pride and um, the LGBTQ plus groups? Um, and it's because I have a trans daughter. Right. So six years ago, seven years ago, I wouldn't be on this panel. Right. I'm not sure that I knew what the T was seven years ago. So my pride why is because I have to. Right. Because I'm a mom and I have a trans daughter. And my best advice to other allies and people and workplaces is don't wait until you have to, right? I will never again for any marginalized community wait until I have to, right? Because that's not the way to get ahead of these things. Um, so I urge you as, as organizations to um, not wait until you have to and to kind of forge ahead. And I guess that's why you're here. So thanks for being here today. Thank you, Irene. I really appreciate it. Um, Ellen LaPointe, Chief uh, CEO at Fenway Health. Oh. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Colleen. And um, uh, hi to Jennifer and Irene. I'm really happy to be here with, with you both. Um, let's see. Well, I am on this panel because I have the great honor of being the Chief Executive Officer of, of Fenway Health. Um, which is uh, a 50 year old organization that was founded to serve the LGBTQIA plus community, originally a free clinic, you know, providing free healthcare to people without insurance. And today we serve over 34,000 people, um, about 17% of whom uh, identify um, as uh, transgender or, oops, sorry about that, um, or gender non-binary. Uh, so um, uh, I, I'm here today just, I think, to reflect the uh, experience of, of, of this wonderful institution that's been around for a long time. And I'll talk more about what we do during the hour. Personally, I... Um, Let's see, I came to this organization just over a year ago. I had the good fortune of beginning on March 9th, 2020. I think I have the makings of a book at some point about that experience as it coincided with COVID. Um, but it's been an extraordinary opportunity really to see the organization at its best. I have come from, I've worked in philanthropy. I have a law degree. I've worked in healthcare, uh, did a lot of work in HIV in the early days, uh, sort of late eighties, early nineties and sort of the deepest, darkest parts of the epidemic. Um, and really the through lines are, you know, connection, community, purpose, social justice, equity. Uh, it's kind of what I'm about. So, um, and I'm a big connector and relationship builder. And I love, love, love getting people together um, and sort of facing in the same direction um, in pursuit of shared goals and a vision for a better future. So that's um, kind of what lights me up every morning when I come to work. So I'll pause there. That's awesome, Ellen. Thank you. I feel lighted up just from what you said. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> Um, great. So let's jump in. Uh, we have a number of questions. And if the audience would like to ask a question, please drop it in the Q&A and we'll make sure that we have time to get to them. So my first question, um, you know, before we jump in, I don't want to assume that our audience has mastered some of the correct and up to date LGBT plus language and terminology. So, Jennifer, um, could you break it down for us? What what does it mean? What does non-binary mean? And what's the difference between gender expression and gender identity? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, you know, I know there was a, a prior panel where folks really were immersed in these topics as well. But I agree. I think it's helpful to take a step back uh, and really make sure we have a shared understanding. And I want to just say, um, and that is that I think it's important to appreciate that the point of having words to describe people's experiences is to understand people's experiences. And what's important is being able to communicate um, in, in ways that are respectful. So for me, the uh, that means that the experiences, individuals' experiences drive the words and not the other way around. And I you know, especially think in a, in a corporate environment or really any environment, I don't come with a perspective of correct language um, because I, I think it's also important to understand that language shifts over time. As I said, I've been doing this, um, this work for over 20 years and, and have been involved 
you know, for decades before that as well, as I know many of the folks certainly on this panel and on this um, call have been as well. And we've seen language shift over time. And so it's really important to understand and appreciate the cultural and social context in which language um, evolves. And I'll also say as a parent of teens, I'm sort of exquisitely uh, focused as well on the shifting dynamics and the ways in which you know my perceptions and, and um, my understanding of language might be different uh, in, in generational ways as well. So I do think, uh, and John mentioned this at the outset, it's so important to be able to also appreciate that we will all make mistakes uh, as we use language. And it's a, a good way to be connected to other people to understand and appreciate what their experiences are and how language lands. And it's also an important thing to be able to acknowledge and recognize if we use language in ways that doesn't uh, uh, recognize or appreciate someone else's experience and then to learn and to grow from those uh, interactions. So with all that said, I'm happy to provide some basic terms and we can surely add others as we go through this conversation. And um, I know you were starting asking in terms of uh, what it means to be non-binary, but I'm gonna start with uh, what it means to be transgender. And it's kind of interesting because the Supreme Court uh, just a little more than a year ago uh, gave some more context to this in uh, from a legal framework. But when I speak of uh, someone who's transgender, I'm describing the experience of someone who is assigned or identified at birth as a particular sex, typically male or female, but who lives their life in a way that is different than that stereotypically associated with that particular identified sex. And in particular, a transgender man is someone who lives and identifies as a man, a transgender woman, is someone who lives and identifies as a woman. We use the term in the language of sexual orientation to refer to um, uh, the typically the ways in which um, someone, uh, to describe someone's associational and emotional attractions to someone else. And that refers to that experience of lesbian, gay, bisexual, pansexual, and really a range of other um, words that are used to describe someone's associational or emotional attraction or sexual orientation. And then getting to where uh, you started in the question, uh, the non-binary experience um, or, or language describes someone whose identity and specifically their gender identity, that internalized sense, felt sense of who they are, uh, doesn't fit within stereotypical assumptions of male or female or not exclusively male or female. It can include um, someone who may identify as male and female, neither male nor female, someone who identifies as gender fluid or some other combination of gendered um, experiences. And then you also uh, asked about the difference between gender identity and gender expression. And uh, again, here I think of gender identity as a deep internally felt sense of a person's gender and gender expression is typically associated with the way that that person outwardly manifests. Um, that identity. And as I said, you know, these, these terms are really about describing people's experiences and really helping and fostering ways that people can understand one another. And so we do see them shift over time. Jennifer, that's great. Thank you. I, I think you're right. The, um, the evolution of language is um, happening all the time. And I know sometimes people say, well, I don't want to say the wrong thing. So I'm just not going to say anything. And I always think, you know, the best thing, if, if you have Attention is to ask, you know. Um, so I appreciate everything that you said. Thank you, um, Irene. So I would ask, could you tell us what does it mean to transition in the workplace? So what does it mean to transition in the workplace? It is different for every single person who transitions in the workplace. So if you think of someone who might be non-binary or doesn't conform with man or woman, as Jennifer talked about, that may be, I'm changing my pronouns and you should respect them. Could be really, really simple. Um, <clears throat> when it gets more complicated, it's, it's really when someone is transitioning from male to female or from female to male, right? Which is a, a, a a bigger uh, change for folks. Um, and so what that means could be a lot, right? It could be that I am just going to use new pronouns and a different name, right? I'm just going to identify with a new name and new pronouns, and I expect you, right, to respect that. It could be that I'm going to also socially transition, and I'm going to show up at work, and I am going to appear or express myself as the identity that I um, 
I, I, I am, right? So I am going to express myself through clothing or jewelry or makeup or whatever else, you know, this world conforms to as male or female, right? And expression gets it, makes it a little bit more complicated. Um, it could also include a medical transition, right? So um, full medical transition or partial, right? So it could be the shaving of a trach. It could be... Um, uh, gender confirmation surgery. So every single transition in the workplace is different. Um, what's the same about every transition in the workplace is that the workplace needs to be prepared, right? The person who is transitioning, they know what they're doing, right? They understand transitioning. They understand maybe not as much as they should, what, how they should be supported, but they understand who they are. It's everyone else who needs to be far better than they are at um, being great allies, understanding language, understanding policies and uh, sticking with them and those sorts of things. So hopefully I've answered your question. Yeah, Irene, that was great, thank you. I think you're right, the decision has been made. Now it's the responsibility of the workplace to be supportive. And I'll come back to you with a question on that in a little bit, um, thank you. Um, so Ellen, I'd like to ask you, um, and we had a question come in that, so I'll make this a two-part question. How can an organization demonstrate a culture that is trans inclusive? And I, the question that came in was how should employers who are inclusive and supportive deal with clients and customers who are not? So within the workplace and then, you know, with the external clients, I'd love your perspective on that. Great. I will, I will get the ball rolling, but I expect my, um, my colleagues here also might have something to add. Um, but um, yeah, fundamentally, um, I think some of us have heard this old adage, uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast, right? So the organization's culture is kind of, when I think about it, it's kind of the breath of the place, right? It's really the, it's the oxygen that keeps you going all day. It makes it uh, an environment that is either hospitable and survivable or not. I mean, you literally, if you take that metaphor forward, um, you need an oxygenated, rich environment to in which to thrive, and 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 so, in this context, thinking about um, inclusiveness, if you will, um, um, it really has to infuse the whole of the organization in a whole host of ways. So, and some of that's, and I actually, what I would offer, I, I don't know uh, who's actually uh, joined us today as participants in this um, group, but I'm just going to say I would expect if you are on this. Uh, call this morning, um, you are already interested and hopefully engaged and probably have your own responses. And I would encourage you to offer them in the chat to um, colleagues here today. And um, we can get a conversation going about things you know that have worked in your workplace. But for us, um, just at Fenway Health, just, to, just sort of basics, right? You know, you, you really need to lead by example. So this is something that um, you're not uh, deploying some small group of people to manage and navigate uh, as a little SWAT team going through the place. It has to be the whole place. We all have to be a part of, of this um, um, effort, making it a, a priority really to build a workplace culture that's safe, that's welcoming, that creates a sense of belonging uh, for transgender, gender diverse employees um, so that they can, so that they wanna be here, right? So that they wanna work with us and contribute. So this is, starts with some very pro, sort of base, what you would think of as basic steps, I would hope, um, ensuring that the non-discrimination workplace statement is um, explicitly includes gender identity and expression. Um, making sure that you have all gender bathroom facilities inside your buildings that are clearly marked and accessible, um, not behind staff paywalls, for example. I mean, just really around um, and, and visible to people so that they don't have to go ask um, where to find that. Um, make sure your health insurance plan covers gender affirming medical treatment, inclusive of surgery, um, and then make sure that that coverage is not out of reach in terms of um, prohibitive deductibles, for example, like put the time and effort in to negotiate that with an insurer. Um, um, work, I think, in the HR space to develop really proactive, positive recruiting strategies to, that, are, that are designed to invite and attract transgender and gender diverse employees um, at all levels of the organization sort of throughout. Um, we want to make sure that um, we make, again, take affirmative steps to tell the world that we welcome and invite transgender um, applicants to roles um, in, our in our organizations, um, recruiting that way, uh, making sure that the HR uh, department or whoever does recruiting in your organization is knowledgeable and, and really at ease 
in, in kind of um, um, doing that recruiting, that essential recruiting work to create these environments. Make sure that your HR department understands what some of the barriers might be for transgender employees who have maybe transitioned later in a career and who are dealing with um, then um, potential um, barriers of, uh, in terms of kind of having access to prior uh, worth, uh, prior professional context and references and experiences uh, that might've occurred prior to their transition. You have to navigate that with applicants and help them help you essentially. Um, so, um, that's that's sort of a, a, at a top level. I think I could go further. Uh, should I keep going for another couple of seconds on this, or do you want me to pause here and open up? Sure, please. Okay. So then, once inside the organization, you know, we again we've heard this a couple of times. You do not want to um, force or require uh, transgender and gender diverse people themselves, or even a small cadre of of people in the organization, to do the lifting here. So um, you want to build programming. Um, and trainings and expectations uh, for all staff, uh, it, starting with new, or, new employee orientation. Everyone in the organization should be learning to use their, uh, their pro, share their pronouns at the outset of any conversation that they're having internally and externally with someone they've never met before. Um, effective communication, cultural sensitivity, and make this just a part of your day one work. Um, consider whether there uh, might be opportunities to um, in, encourage or establish uh, affinity groups for uh, transgender and gender diverse employees. Make those visible. All of this is signaling and actually creating space um, for transgender people to basically be a part of things and not have to create and manage and navigate otherness all day while trying to accomplish the mission of your organization, which is really what they're there to do, right? Um, how do we communicate? Are we making visible important dates in the trans community? You know, Transgender Awareness Month. Are we thinking about Transgender Day of Remembrance? Are we doing anything like that? Like we might be doing for MLK Junior Day and other days um, that we are marking uh, that are important to people in our community. And then of course, making sure that we have um, real ways of kind of bringing people um, into conversation when they are either unwilling or unable to um, impactfully um, or effectively engage this way. I think Jennifer, you were great in sort of setting the stage about really being patient, open, forgiving, I mean, creating a culture of learning in an environment like that. And, but also just being willing to name it when someone is simply reticent or hesitant or unwilling or hostile, frankly. Um, that is um, our problem as employees. That is not the problem of the, it cannot be the problem of our transgender colleagues. So we have got to intervene when we know that that's occurring. So I'll pause there and let others jump in. That was fantastic, thank you. Um, and you know, you're right, culture permeates the organization and you know, leaders really set the tone a lot of times too for that culture. Um, Irene, I'm, I'd love to hear your perspective on you know, a, a leader's role um, in setting that tone for employees. Sure, sure. And I tried to take notes when Ellen was talking because wow, <laughs> that was really good. Um, you know, from a leader's perspective and from an employer's perspective, I think there are some tactical things that you can do that are really easy, right? Add your pronouns to your signature, number one, right? And it will drive conversation, I guarantee it. So I work in a very large corporation. I probably added my pronouns three or four years ago before uh, it was a thing because it's who I am. And I can't tell you the conversations. Why do you have your pronouns? It just opens up the ability to educate. Um, I think tact tactically as well, uh, Ellen, you know, the employee experience, as you talked about, from application all the way through actually working in an organization. So does your application have pronouns on it? Right? Does it ask, are you non-binary or trans? Right? Those things are signals to not only trans people, right? Um, and the people who love them and support them, which young people are very different uh, today. So if you want to hire the future, got to be thinking about that. Um, but it also sends a message to people who may not be supportive of trans people, right? I, I don't want to work where someone's not supportive, good, then don't apply, right? So, and then all the way through the experience where when I'm looking at um, an internal procedure on how to answer the phone, they is the right pronoun to use when you're talking to someone because you may not know the, the pronouns, right? So inclusive language throughout. Uh, again, as leaders, put your pronouns in there, um, tell your story, tell it loudly, make people listen. Um, 
which can be hard unless you're one of those people who wants to make people listen. Find that voice who, who, who does want to make sure that um, they are the ally and they want to tell the story uh, for the trans folks in your organization. Um, I talked earlier about um, uh, transgender guidelines uh, or transition guidelines in the workplace. Make sure people can find them. They can be real good, but if you put into your intranet transition or transgender and nothing pops up, they really aren't uh, going to do you any good, and they're certainly not going to help your employees. Uh, so that's super important. Um, educate, as Ellen said, educate, educate, educate. Um, all the way from uh, beginning to end. Um, trying to see if there was anything else I tried to jot down really, really fast. Um, and then I will go back to um, what Colleen said earlier about being an ally um, or allyship. So again, you're only an ally if someone calls you an ally when you're not in the room, right? <laughs> when you're not there, they're calling you an ally. Um, so make sure that if you are uh, in that space where you can make a difference, um, be brave and, just step in. I, I never ask permission. I always explain after, right? So putting my pronouns in my signature very early on, I had many people say, so where'd you get the permission? I'm like, I didn't ask. I put my pronouns in. So sometimes we have to be bold and uh, take that first step. Thank you, Irene. Um, and sure. I appreciate Irene, um, you know, commenting on speaking up uh, because I'll share Irene, um, you know, I was working in an organization and, and she shared her story, came and, and spoke and an employee reached out to me and said, um, I've been working here for 20 years and this is the first time, you're the first person that I've told that I have a trans kid. So because of Irene speaking up as an ally and sharing her story, that person was finally able to feel safe and comfortable. So I just you know, wanted to share that because it was a profound moment um, for me and, and I have no doubt for that person. Um, so thank you. So we're getting a lot of good questions in and one touches, you touched on this, Irene, but I'd like to throw it out to the panel to see if there's anything you'd like to add. So the question is, please address the different challenges presented by hiring a trans person as a new hire and dealing with an existing employee or manager who transitions comes out in the workplace. So hiring new, you know, what are the different challenges hiring somebody or if somebody's transitioning in the workplace? So I'll take that and then I'll, I'll send it to my, uh, my fellow panelists. Um, you know, for someone transitioning in the workplace, it's very different than someone joining the workplace that has already transitioned, uh, at least socially. So um, again, the answer for both is education right? Mm -hmm. It's education for both. Someone transitioning in the workplace, male to female, female to male, or, or um, you know, changing pronouns. Um, it, the manager is really, really important and sometimes can be the biggest challenge along the way or the biggest advocate, right? So oftentimes uh, folks really do surprise you. Um, so it's getting ahead of it. Hopefully you have some really good practices within your organization about transitioning in the workplace. Um, I'll say it a hundred times if I'm allowed to. Um, transitioning in the workplace is not, I'll say it again, not the transgender employee's responsibility. In my opinion, and again, it's it's my opinion, it is HR's responsibility. Just like choosing health insurance practices, policies, procedures, hiring, all of that stuff. It's our, it's our responsibility as HR to um, shepherd folks through a transition. You know, I've, I have had many folks say to me, <clears throat> trans folks say to me, can't you just send an email, right? I, I don't want that kind of attention. And, and sometimes that will work, um, maybe in very small organizations. And this is a real, it sound, it's gonna sound terrible, but my answer usually is it's not all about you, right? Most people want to be good, right? We are a good society of human beings, at least I, I uh, that's what I, I hang my hat on, right? And so if we can educate the people around the person transitioning, how do you use pronouns? How do you correct yourself when you make a mistake? Because you're gonna. How do you show that you welcome the person back, right? As their true self. The answers are all super, super easy, but they're not if you don't know, right? So it's all about educating the people around. When hiring someone who is transgender, it's no one's business. 
right? It really isn't. The transgender person is coming to the workplace as a female or male or non-binary. They will use their pronouns. They will um, in some ways reflect who they are, right? Again, if we don't use pronouns, we might not know, right? So assuming pronouns can be very challenging, uh, which is why we all have pronouns in our signatures, why we introduce ourselves using our pronouns. Because again, <clears throat> expression can get in the way, right? Of our perception of who someone is versus their own perception. Um, so, you know, from an HR perspective, if someone is very um, open about being transgender, maybe even open about being nervous coming into the workplace as a transgender person, um, get in front of it, educate, you know, you talk to the person about how they want to be introduced into the organization um, and always, always offer um, education to the folks around that person. But again, uh, someone joining the organization as a transgender female, that is their business and their business only. Uh, so we always want to make sure to not um, um, get ahead of that, right? So if someone transitions in the workplace and uh, now she is Sally, um, she uses she, her pronouns, and next week Johnny joins and Johnny uses he, him pronouns. It is not my business to tell Johnny, just so you know, right? Sally's a transgender female. Mm -mm. <clears throat> Right. If Sally wants to share that, Sally can share. Right. Um, but it's not my business to tell anyone in the workplace or in public. Um, so that's what I have. That's yeah. great. Thank you. I, I was going to add a little, Colleen, if that's OK. Oh, yeah. um, I, I just I was thinking, Irene, as you were talking, um, you know, I haven't done as much exercise recently as I like, but um, I'm trying to get back into it now with the good weather. And I was thinking as I was cycling the other day of something that uh, a good friend of mine said, which is, you know, when you have a headache because you haven't been hydrating enough when you exercise, it's like you've waited too long. And the time to make sure you hydrate is at the beginning and throughout the period of your exercise. So I just share that story to say um, that if you are waiting to put in place protocol for addressing uh, someone's transi trans transition in the workplace to when the first transgender person does that, you've really waited too long. And the same is true for making sure that you have workplace policies in place for hiring. So I was really, you know, it's a great question about what are the differences um, when you hire a transgender person versus when someone transitions in the workplace. And it made me really think that there shouldn't be uh, differences because you need to have in place all of the policies both for ensuring you know, equal treatment of all your employees at the time that they're hired. And that's true regardless of gender identity, but also sexual orientation and race and gender and disability um, and age. And uh, you also need to make sure that those policies are effective and in place before you have somebody that transitions in the workplace. And so kind of going back to Irene's point, I do think that education um, ongoing education, right? I, and, and this is changing. I'm, I'm so heartened to see companies that have really integrated non-discrimination policies that include transgender people in the workplace. But, you know, um, it's of course not true across the board. And the problem uh, companies face is when they, for the first time, are thinking about how to ensure, uh, a, you know, a, a safe and equal workplace environment for transgender at the the, the time that they first think that they have a transgender person in the workplace. And that's, you know, that's like, you've waited too long to hydrate once you have a headache and then it is Completely a problem. Agree. Um, and then I just also wanted to go back because I thought there was a really good question, which is a challenging question. You know, what do you do about clients and customers that mm -hmm. are uh, not treating a transgender um, employee <clears throat> fairly? And again, I think that, I mean, there's probably a lot to share and I'm, I'm certain there's others on the call who would have more to share on that as well. But I think it also goes back very centrally to um, communication about company values and making sure that clients and customers know right at the outset that as a company, you value all of your employees, regardless of um, gender, race, sex, disability, all of the other categories that are important to identify and to make sure that you put out information that the company holds all of your employees to the same standards of quality service and that you know, you're responsive to any uh, concerns that there might be about you know, provision of those services and then respond in the same ways that you would respond to a client or a customer that was treating 
uh, a woman in a different way than a man or a uh, religious minority. And, you know, I'm just thinking, you know, I don't want to keep going on, I'll stop in a minute, but, you know, I, I worked in big law now, it's probably 30 years ago. And, you know, there, there was a time when there were lots of um, clients who didn't want to work with women and female partners. And it's been, a you know, a real effort uh, for law firms to shift their policies and practices to make sure that there are advancement opportunities for women. Um, and the same has got to be true for LGBTQ employees in order for them to advance in the workplace. And you know, I'm sure others have lots more to say on that, but it's a great question and really important discussion. Yeah, thank you, Jennifer. A question did come in. I was going to ask about, um, you know, we were talking about the challenges in the workplace. And, you know, I, I think a big challenge could be if another employee is not accepting. And, and a question came in. I'd just like to read it because I think it relates to uh, the thread that we're on. Um, I'm a transgender man and personally find it much easier to actively support other trans folks when I have time to plan. For instance, setting up a training session or making a written resource. But what about those interactions that catch you off guard? For example, a colleague who accidentally or purposely misgenders or dead names someone in your presence. What constructive techniques have you found helpful when intervening in the moment? That's a long question, but I think it's, you know, if you're if you're facing resistance um, and, you know, for that employee, any suggestions from the panel on how they could address it? I'll start at a higher level and, and just uh, just say uh, and appreciate the um, the question specifically being around constructive techniques. Um, uh, I think as and I, you know, this could be, we could have this conversation in any context in this, in this place we are living right now in this time around what, what it means to model patience and grace um, and to really um, invite people into um, sort of meeting each other as human beings, first and foremost, to, uh, so much is going wrong, I think, in our country and in the world, because that fundamental disconnect is happening at all times. And so with these invitations in to kind of just name it and say, this is what I'm experiencing right now. This is what um, I'm going to invite you to do. That only can go so far. And I think to at, at, after a certain point, that does become a, a huge burden on someone to have to continually go back and say, no, really, I need you to get this right. I need you to pay attention. Um, I think so. So don't, you know, one thing we can do is we can intervene um, in the room when we witness, we can be upstanders in that regard, rather than just expect the person who's being misgendered to do that lifting in a space. If again, if, if it involves more than a few people in a space, for example, not just an individual interaction, modeling that, um, modeling uh, our own willingness to kind of pause, note our error and move forward um, to correct, you know, just being really comfortable and willing to show that is really, I think that can go really far and do that with a, with ease and just, you know, um, um, warmth. Um, but if someone keeps keeps doing this over and over again um, um, or claims they just can't get, you know, you, we've, we've probably all witnessed this, you know, or, or you know, I just can't, I'm sorry, I just can't get it right. Um, that, that kind of, I'm abdicating any responsibility to respect you uh, as you have asked me to. Um, Needs, there needs to be an intervention. And, and, and in my view, um, that intervention might be more effective if you pull the person aside and do it privately with them so that they are not being shamed in a space um, themselves, um, but to really use a private conversation to convey to them the expectation of the organization that in order to be here, they actually have to get this. Um, and if they really don't feel like this is something they can do, we would be more than happy to help them move on. I mean, literally, that's kind of where we're at. Um, but, but, but fundamentally, we have to provide the programs, the services, the training. Um, most people right now in this moment do not walk into the organizations that they work in with this um, facility. We have got to provide resources and training. And if you don't have that expertise inside your organization, you have the capacity to budget resources to make that happen. You can hire Irene, for example, just saying. Um, but you know, that's that's the obligation, I think, from a sort of a, an employer or leadership standpoint that I would offer. Um, so that's my thinking. Thank you. Ellen, I have an, uh, another question, actually, I think that would be appropriate for you that has come in. Um, a question about health insurance coverage. Um, this person has their health insurance covers gender affirming surgery for adults, but not minors. So um, they had to cover the costs of their trans son transitioning. 
Yeah. And um, they'd like to know, is this standard and what is the rationale? Actually, can I pitch that over to Jennifer? Um, Jennifer, do you have the, I think you're probably in a better position to know the legal aspects of this. Yeah, I'm happy to take that on. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I will say that this is um, uh, uh, a problem as a practical matter and also a legal problem for companies, right? It is unlawful to exclude coverage um, based on someone's transgender status, and that includes uh, denial of coverage um, for for anyone else that's reliant on the employee for uh, insurance coverage. And it is absolutely true that there are insurance policies that are out there that deny coverage, just as there have long been um, policies, although it's you know significantly changed in more recent years, that had earlier ex denied coverage for any uh, medical care relating to gender transition, and then sort of evolutions of coverage that provided hormones but not surgery, uh, provided surgery but not other elements of care. And it really is on companies to ensure that they do provide coverage, that there, there are uh, insurance companies that make that available. Massachusetts law is um, uh, pretty specific on this. I can talk a little more when we get to it, but with the Supreme Court opinion just over a year ago in the Bostock case in which the Supreme Court made clear that uh, federal employment non-discrimination law, Title VII prohibits discrimination on uh, the basis of transgender status, that uh, it is um, uh, impermissible to deny coverage as well based on transgender status. That said, as I, you know, as uh, there certainly are many policies out there, GLAD has been um, engaged in an effort to ensure that where those policies arise, that um, we have addressed those issues as a matter of law, as have the other legal organizations across the country. There is no medical or scientific basis for denying care um, to transgender young people. To the contrary, it undermines um, health outcomes and all of the major medical professional associations are in agreement on that point. And so it's, uh, you know, as I said, I've been doing this work for a significant period of time. And, uh, you know, decades ago, companies just didn't provide any medical care for transgender employees. And obviously that was led to compounding issues and problems for everything, hiring, development, advancement, and beyond. And the law has, um, you know, court cases have more specifically addressed that issue. The Affordable Care Act has a specific non-discrimination provision that, um, uh, is is clear about the uh, application of the law to uh, insurance coverage. So, I, I, I it's a great question, you know, because it is a way that I uh, when we kind of go back to the questions about culture and climate and what HR offices um, need to do to ensure comprehensive coverage. It's it's not necessarily something that I, you know I know people look closely at when they're considering insurance purchase, but it is a way to ensure that you don't hit those kind of roadblocks in, in the future. And um, yeah, I mean, you know, cause you, you have, you have, or will have employees who don't know that they will have transgender uh, kids as well. And uh, when that happens, it's important to be sure that everybody's covered. So Jennifer, what should an employee do if, you know, if their minor child is being denied coverage? Yeah. That's gonna take. Um, yeah, so well, one is um, go ahead and call GLAD. We're very uh, open to those calls. You can reach out either through our website or we have um, uh, GLAD Answers, the, the line that is um, staffed every day and reach out to us and let us know. There's a couple steps to take. One is to see what the basis for the denial is. Sometimes uh, it is that there actually is an exclusive exclusion in the insurance contract, which you can um, you know, know by taking a look at the documents, not everybody does, um, that, you know, describe the scope of coverage. Sometimes it happens kind of uh, behind the contract in an administrative review of the request for coverage. Uh, typically, you have to go through the appeal process of insurance, and oftentimes that involves working with the medical professionals to ensure that you've submitted all of the documentation to um, reflect the underlying medical need. And if it, you know, if it comes back to the, from the insurance company that there is a, you know, a, a specific exclusion in the contract, then I would go and talk to someone at HR 
um, and you know, explained that the contract doesn't meet the required uh, scope of coverage and advocate for inclusive coverage. Um, sometimes companies, you know, need to go back and renegotiate a contract of insurance. Sometimes they need to provide the coverage for their employee at that time because it might, you know, might take a more extended period of time to renegotiate the contract, but you need to provide the coverage for the employee at the time that it's needed. And so um, uh, HR can be great advocates for their you know, employees when those issues arise. And then if all of those um, uh, hit walls, then for sure reach out to, to GLAD and we have you know, worked with a lot of folks to try to advocate for coverage. That's a great answer. Yep. Thank you, Jennifer. And speaking of HR, I think we have a few HR folks on the line. We do have a, a few specific questions. Um, one is about new hire paperwork and what is appropriate questions to ask about identity. Um, we also had a question about background checks and you know just the, the issues there. So I'm not sure if one of our panelists would like to, to take that. So I, I'm glad to talk about it early on and then I'll let um, our other panelists jump in on the more technical pieces. Um, again, I think the answer is to get ahead of it, right? Have it on your application, right? Do you, what pronouns do you use? That's gonna give you an indication. Um, how do you identify? What is your gender identity? Is it trans? Is it non-binary? Is it male? Is it female? You have to ask those questions up front. Otherwise you may not know. Right. You hired, if you hired my daughter, you would never know unless she told you which she would. But you would never know that she was trans. Right. So you may never know. Uh, again, as Jennifer said earlier, you got to get ahead of it so that you can react to it when someone is hired that is trans. Um, and I guarantee you that's going to happen. Right. Um, if, if you're showing up, which all of you are showing up today. So I assume that's going to happen, right? Um, again, ahead of it, put it on your application, make sure that they can identify very early on in your process. Um, otherwise, you, you don't really have a place to start that conversation if needed. I will add, um, and I'm going to ask quickly for maybe Jennifer to tell me if I have this right. Uh, the background question is a very important one. We do background checks. To every Everybody who works at Family Health or is a member of our board of directors uh, is required to undergo a background check. Um, and uh, fundamentally, um, although I, I've not actually encountered this question directly myself in my role, my ex expectation and belief is that HR needs all appropriate information to do a thorough background check and they have to maintain that confidentially. I don't know how though, um, if there's any constraint there that you would offer Jennifer over and above that, but but the, here I would speak to the employer obligation to ensure that every employee has had a thorough background check and that nothing important that must be known is, is missed. So we have, to, we have to overcome that barrier to, to some degree. Yeah, I mean, I guess what I, what I was going to add to that is, again, it's important to have policies that the information is restricted on a need to know basis, and right. that there are no negative consequences that are going to be uh, experienced as a result of the ways in which the background check may and likely will for many people disclose the fact of someone being transgender. Um, you know, the problem is when the information that is provided then results in and, you know, I've gotten these calls, the withdrawal of an offer, uh, disclosure sure. of private medical information. I mean, there need to be policies and practices in place that restrict the dissemination of the information. So it's not the, you know, it's not the, it's not the background check itself that's problematic as long as the information that it discloses regarding to transgender status is not um, then, you know, doesn't have negative implications for the right. employee. And if your HR department is not capable of maintaining that confidentiality, then you have <laughs> bigger problems than this. I mean, this is, a, this is a very big problem, but you have very, very foundational issues in your HR department. Yeah, yeah. And, and then I wanted to follow up a little bit on what Irene said. And there was a question, I think, also about doing surveys and getting demographic information for um, companies that don't have uh, that as part of their company culture. And I'm not, I'm not sure I, I fully understand the specifics of that. But the one thing I want to say about uh, information collection and data collection and demographics, and Ellen, I mean, I'm guessing you can speak to this as well, is that it is important 
um, to make information optional when it's not needed for uh, you know workplace purposes. Uh, it can be important for transgender employees who want to be able to disclose and ensure that they have protection, but it really should be done in, a, in an optional way, as Ellen was saying before, and there needs to be really uh, mechanisms that are in place that uh, keeps the information um, that doesn't need to be shared private. Um, and you know, I, I think check boxes work the worst in terms of people being able to provide information about their identities. And I often get this question like, how many check boxes can we add? Which I understand and I know, you know, there's database um, oriented systems that need checks and boxes, but also, and I've talked to a lot of healthcare systems that I think have navigated this in incredibly uh, positive ways. So I know it's possible, but I think fill in the blanks can be much more helpful. Um, if if, if uh, you want to be able to collect information. And then again, as I said, doing it in an anonymized way that doesn't disclose information, but that allows a company to collect data that they need um, can, can be a really uh, good way forward. Ellen, do you have- I think that's a perfect answer. I think, you know, it's one thing that we've been, in the, in the broader context of COVID, for example, Fenway Health had been working from sort of the very outset to make sure that we could get, that they were tracking sexual orientation and gender identity information about the emergence of the pandemic. I mean, we do care about this information. We It's helpful to know um, in the aggregate kind of who is being impacted. Um, um, you know, your staff retention policies, how, what can you learn about who's staying and who's going and why? You know, this, this data is of service to us, but it has to be, um, for learning and for growth, right? And you really want to be able to track if, if, if all of the trans staff keep leaving, you want to know that. And, and But you need to have access to that information, as Jennifer said, in ways that protect the identities of those who are, that invite them in and frankly, explain the rationale. Oftentimes we just fail to explain why we want information. Why do we do that? We should tell people why we need this. Just let's treat each other like adults and say, Here's what we do with this and why it's valuable to us and how we learn. So just, you know, offering a little context and um, and assurances of, of confidentiality and safety. And of course, never, never uh, associating identity, uh, specific identifying information with with aggregate data. Um, these are basic practices that I think serve us well in all cases. But we need this information to 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 know how we're doing. Um, um, qualitative and quantitative both. So I love fill in the blanks. I love exit interviews. But as you can appreciate, those are sometimes also complex for people to kind of navigate. So there may be some blending of simple and more nuanced ways of learning things. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I just have to jump in one more time because I, I love your the points, Ellen, that you were making um, about make, you know, like you can provide information which explains why you're asking the information that you're asking for. And I was just thinking, about, um, you know, we got calls because there was a major um, pharmacy that was asking questions uh, uh, connected to COVID vaccinations about assigned birth sex. And, um, you know, for understandable reasons, I mean, folks should just know if you're asking people what their assigned birth sex is, transgender people are going to be skeptical right. <laughs> and, and, and distrustful because there is a real serious history of that information being used against people. So just know that will be a starting point, which I think is an understandable starting point for transgender people. And if there is no reason to ask someone's assigned birth sex, then it's not a helpful thing to ask. If there is a reason, then including an explanation is really important because, um, you know, people can yeah. understand why it's being asked. I, I want to say it turned out in that context, there was no reason to ask the question and the question was eventually removed. And, you know, one of the challenges is if you ask the question, there might be a lot of supposition as to the reasons why. I mean, as you pointed out, Ellen, there are lots of good examples of why you do want to maintain data to ensure non-discrimination, to ensure adequate health outcomes and a whole, you know, range of other issues. But sometimes there really isn't. And so I think those two points are so important. One is like always rethink why you're asking the questions that you're asking, right. make sure that there's a reason to do so. And when there is, provide the information as to what it is. Right, when, and I would add that if you're gonna ask the question, you need to have the right answers, right? So um, in the state we live in, when my daughter signed up for her, her uh, COVID vaccine, um, they asked, and I can't remember if it was sex or gender, but they included male, female, and trans. 
so how was she going to answer that question? So we had a, an incredibly long dialogue around how do I answer this question? I'm like, well, the test group probably didn't have trans people in it. Just tell the person when you get the shot, right? Um, so we have to make sure that the answers are there correct, right? So she is a trans female, right? Um, again, health insurance, I'll tell you a really quick story. Uh, this young woman who, you know, I always hear these stories after and then I cry. Um, every time she goes to urgent care, every single time, right? She's asked, are you male or are you female? She answers female. The first question she gets every time is, when was your last period? Right, and because she's who she is, her answer is always, oh, period, what's a period? I don't have that, right? And she really does that. Um, but you, you know, it's, it's very basic, um, but it is the first question that she gets every time. So one, if you're gonna ask the question, you have to have the right answers. And yes, you should be asking the question. One um, little, um, this is actually a rule of thumb, which is a phrase we're not meant to use any longer. This is a general rule in our uh, you know, practices in our organization, regardless, is whenever you're capturing data, you, know, you really do wanna distinguish that which is interesting from that which is relevant. And, and really just asking the question every time, why are we gathering this information? What are we gonna do with it? How is it of service to us? Because not only is that respectful in ways that we're describing, um, we are so busy and overburdened all the time. Like the, the staff is constantly navigating, you know, over like lots and lots of demands on their time. Capturing information and making reports is busy work. Uh, unless there's use for it. So just, you know, that's a simple discipline you can introduce that can be helpful. Great point, thank you. Uh, thank you all. This is um, a lot of great information. I, I've been actually taking notes myself. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we're getting close to the hour and I want to give Cheryl Caton a chance to talk about some exciting fall programming coming up. But before we move to Cheryl, I'd like to ask the panelists uh, a last question. And that is, what do you hope for future generations of trans employees, allies, and trans inclusive organizations? And Ellen, you're next to me in your Zoom box. So I'll just start with you. Oh, I don't know. It just made me smile because I hope for everything. I mean, I just, <laughs> I mean, I hope that um, I really, first of all, I need to name because we haven't done this yet on this uh, in this session. I hope to reach a place one day where we are not having to constantly uh, deal with uh, defensive responses to hostile and and you know violent policy making basically which is really the barrage right now of anti-trans um, legislative and policy making activity at state level and otherwise is is so astonishing um, um, and and disheartening and, and terrifying I just hope that that you know one day this will not be our reality uh, to a degree I, I I see it as a measure of progress that the resistance is rising. Um, um, but I, I, this is going to be quite a quite a road we have to row uh, walk together um, as we get through this. Um, I, I think it's going to be a really challenging number of years in this space. Um, you know, I want people to walk in and um, not feel like they have to take a deep breath when they talk about who they are. <laughs> That's what I want. I want people to uh, come to work as their full selves. This is true as well. We're talking. We haven't spoken about race equity once today. You know, this is a very very complex matter for BIPOC individuals. Um, who are also trans or non-binary uh, or, um, you know, have ranges of gender expressions. They are navigating a whole host of, of, of things in spaces that um, people with white privilege don't have to think about at all. And cis white people certainly don't have to consider. I want us to keep working together and to really meld together these intersectional um, um, opportunities and, and obligations that we have as employers, as human beings, uh, because we are human beings. We're whole, we're whole people and we, we bring all of this every minute. Um, to everything we do. That is a big answer, but it is my actual answer. Thank you, Ellen. <laughs> um, Jennifer, would you like to, to share your perspective? Yeah, I love that answer. Um, and I just, if it's okay, I wanted to fill in a little bit of the detail that Ellen was referring to because uh, as, as hopeful and uh, positive as it is that the Supreme Court, as I said, just over a year ago, issued this groundbreaking opinion that, rec that says you know, federal employment non-discrimination law uh, applies to transgender people. We are also in this unbelievable moment of backlash. I mean, there have been upwards of 80 bills introduced across the country that expressly seek to, uh, den to, to deny inclusion of transgender young people in school programs, 
and in athletics and sports. I mean, it's just devastating. Uh, there are, you know, laws that have been introduced, which have, you know, one of which passed in Arkansas that criminalizes the provision of medical care to transgender young people. Florida just yesterday, you know, the welcome to June Pride Month signed uh, a, a bill into law that prohibits transgender young people from participating in school sports in that state. And so this is the national legislative climate that transgender people are facing and that transgender employees and their family members um, are living through. So I think it is so important to just understand and appreciate the kind of st compounded stress that that adds to um, people's lives. As Ellen talked about, um, you know, many employees have compounding experiences that make it really challenging to be in the workplace and to, to be in, um, in our communities. And so understanding what that means, especially in a time we're coming out of COVID, thankfully, but there's a lot of transition in the workplace that is added to all of those experiences. So I guess, Colleen, circling back, um, I agree with Ellen. I think it is, uh, I hope, some last gasp efforts because of the advances that have been made. And so I look forward to a day when there's full inclusion, full equality uh, for transgender people in the workplace. As I mentioned, I'm a parent of teenagers. I am so amazed and impressed at their ability to understand the range of uh, gender identities uh, among their friends and uh, across their classmates. I think they are heading into a workplace and they will educate um, you know, those of us that are, are years ahead of them in, in uh, work and in professions, but not in understanding of diversity and um, dynamics. And I'll just, I'll just share one quick story. Transgender woman uh, who was an un unbelievable advocate, advocate in um, Connecticut who passed away some months ago, uh, talked about having a PhD in chemistry and being turned away time and again from jobs that she was unbelievably qualified to do. And, uh, you know, she talked to HR and asked what was happening. And it was really apparent that it was because she was transgender. And what was so sad was the loss of the contributions that she could make to those corporate environments, um, not just because of the brilliance that she brought, but also because of who she was and could add to the climate and the culture of the workplace. So I look forward to a day when there's an unbelievable, rich, beautiful diversity of employees and we're all benefited from, from that in the workplace and beyond. Thank you, Jennifer. Irene, we'd love to hear your perspective. Yeah, I, I really, I, I don't have a lot to add to that, right? Wouldn't that be a great place? Um, I've always kind of known that I would have to fight this probably for my lifetime, right? For employees, for the transgender community, for all of that. Um, I've, I'm still praying that my daughter won't have to. I'm still a little bit skeptical there. Um, but, you know, I think it's right, it, you know, as, as we look at, you know, what are, what's our vision for um, the future, the vision is that we don't have to have these conversations, right, because everyone just comes to work and it is what it is, right, but think about what Jennifer said very, very early on today, um, we had to fight for women to be treated equally, and I believe we still are, right, so if we go back to that very first statement that Jennifer made, um, it, it's a road that you know we have to continue. Um, and I'll also add a little bit of color to um, your comments, Jennifer, around the 80 bills out there. You know, again, this is why data is important, right? Because everything we're fighting against, trans, you know, these these girls, you know, uh, that were born as boys play. There's no data that anyone has ever taken away something from a cis girl by playing as a trans girl on a sports team mostly in the states that are actually passing these, these types of uh, laws. From a medical perspective, um, there's some things that I understand, there's some things that I don't, right? So uh, uh, hormones, all of those things at a very young age, I think, I think the media doesn't help us, right? So we are not cutting things off of people, right? When they're four years old, we're stopping the trend, that we're stopping um, what hormones automatically do to us. And we have done that for centuries, right? You know, girls who got their period too early, boys who are not gonna be tall, girls who are gonna be too tall. We've always used hormone therapy. There's no reason not to use it. And there really isn't any kind of medical uh, data behind it that it's it's not the right way to treat people or kids who are transgender. Um, and, you know, again, the, the, there are, there is uh, a population of kids who 
do need to transition under the 18 because of severe gender dysphoria, right? Um, I think those are fewer and farther between than kids who just want to stop puberty from happening. And, you know, girls who don't want a, their voice to change and they don't want uh, facial hair to grow and those things that can be prevented. And the minute you take them off those blockers, they're going back, right? So I, I think that's an important piece as well uh, that I want to mention. And um, thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, everybody. I Before I turn it over to Cheryl, I'll just say that, um, I hear a real sense of hope, but I also feel like we've talked a lot of um, I've talked about a lot of things where we can take action, where employers can actually um, what they should do, what they're and what they're required to do. Um, so a heartfelt thanks to this panel. Um, this was really inspiring, and to our participants as well. We had some great questions come in, so I appreciate that engagement. Um, and before we wrap it up, I'd love to turn it over to Cheryl Caton. Cheryl is a member of the Board of Directors at PIOW, and she has some outstanding programming that we'd like to share for the fall. Hi, hey folks. Um, thanks. Just like Colleen said, thanks to all of our uh, panelists. Thanks to all of the participants who asked such wonderful questions and shared lots of wonderful stories in the chat. It was really wonderful to be talking about these trans employment issues. Um, we put together a small group of uh, trans folks to talk about trans employment issues um, and Pride Now Workplace has been kind enough to really help us uh, create a platform to share those conversations. We're gonna sort of take some time in the summer and let everybody uh, just work on their summer projects. And then when we hit September, we'll start to have regular um, panels like this on a whole host of different um, employment related issues that uh, trans folks work with and have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So you can see the list right there on the slide. So stay tuned through Pride in Our Workplace and other uh, social media outlets to find out about uh, when those um, events will be happening. They'll be virtual um, and they'll be ongoing starting in September. Thanks so much. Thanks, Colleen. Great, thank you, Cheryl. John, you wanna close us hey. out? Pauline, thank you so much. Panelists, you were amazing. I learned so much today, and I think we all feel really great and really comfortable that you are out there advocating for the community and um, your leadership and your passion and your engagement around this is amazing. So we thank you for all that you do. Uh, it was a great conversation. Um, I wanted to say that we are recording it. So folks, we are going to post this on our website. So you'll be able to, to, to uh, see it. We're also going to put together two videos of um, takeaways. Um, and highlights from each of the two sessions that we had in May and June. So we'll make that available if you want to share with that within your uh, within your organizations for help with education. Um, but I'm thrilled um, during this June Pride Month to be part of Pride in Our Workplace. I'm proud of the the, the work that we do and, and, and these amazing panelists sharing their perspectives with us today. So thank you and Cheryl and Colleen, thank you very much as well for your, your leadership and, and facilitating this conversation. I just want to just put up the sponsor slide one more time just to thank them. Um, for their support um, and everyone have a great pride. And what I will say is maybe for pride month, commit to yourself. One thing that you're gonna do within your organization to improve the lives of trans employees um, and commit to doing that during the month. Um, I think that'd be a great way to, to take away this conversation today. So thanks again, everyone have a great day and we'll hopefully see you next time around.